Okay, thank you. And thank you for, for joining our lesson. So uh, just let me start. I, I will start the, the, the lecture in a somewhat unusual way. So for the first, the first slide I have here, ask actually the question, why, where are we actually here? Why are we basing clinical diagnostics on the fluorescence lifetimes. This is so important that I, even before I come to a, to a table of contacts of the presentation, I'll ask this question. And the answer is simple, and I think you also know it, but it's an important thing to remember. Fluorescence lifetime change with the molecular environment of the fluorophore. And therefore, degeneration in the metabolic function of cells and tissue manifests in lifetime changes of endogenous fluorophores. And so there is chance that early stages of degeneration can be detected before they have caused any irreversible damage to cells and tissue. So this is an example. This patient has some strange deposits here along, along the blood vessels. Is this possibly an, a pre-stage of age-related macular degeneration. If we can find this out, there's a chance that we can stop the disease because, before it causes any irreversible damage. So that's it. And I think there is good chance that this works because here it's just a, a result from Lydia Sauer of University of Utah. Lydia, I hope you are with us in, in, this, in this lecture. If not, Probably I give you a, a private lecture because what you did was so important for, for the things I have to report here that I really want to present it especially for you. So this is MACTEL disease and there are situations where Lydia found out you have patients, this is here, where FLIO shows signs of MACTEL disease, but the patient has no symptoms and there is no indication of the MACTEL disease in the conventional images. So there is a chance that we find something out here and probably can start treatment before the, damage, the, the patient really gets damaged or gets really sick. So that's, that's the introduction. And that's actually the, the, the target we want to reach with FLEO. So table of contents of this presentation. I'll, at the beginning, I will so say something about the fluorescence decay functions. What are they telling us? Next section is how our FLIO data are recorded, optical principle, TCSPC FLIM. What are we recording? How do the raw data look like? How will we get a beautiful lifetime image from this ugly photon distribution? What is the instrument response function for this con convolution, the fit procedure, accuracy of FLIM results, and so on? And the most important section probably of the presentation is because this is really what I have to present, where I have to present some new things, are the challenges of FLEO data analysis. I will say something about mistakes in earlier analysis procedures, which we uncovered in the last couple of years, new FLEO data procedures, extremely important how we can separate the fluorescence decays from the fundus in the lens and also show some analysis. And at the end, I will show how you can do all these things with our SPC image and G lifetime analysis. I will provide, I have provided time for questions, typically after the end of all these sections. So we will make a short break with a cup of coffee, of course. So just make sure that you have access to coffee and then you can ask questions and I will do my best to answer, answer these questions. This is good for you. And it's also good for me because from the questions, I get an impression of which points I have especially, especially to emphasize or also maybe which where, 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 where the, really the, the questions and where, where more the, most of the interest is. So, okay, let's start with the fluorescence decay function. Very simple. This is a fluorescence decay function in logarithmic scale. And here's something important, because actually everyone knows it, but it, most people actually don't, don't remember it and don't, don't take it into real consideration. The decay function of a single fluorophore 
or a homogeneous assembly of fluorophore molecule in a homogeneous molecular environment is always single exponential. It has to be single exponential because this is, this is just this quantum mechanics, the probability to return from the excited state of the molecule is time invariant. So no matter how long ago the fluorescence, the, the, the molecule was excited, whether it's here or here or there, it doesn't remember it. There's a constant probability to return to the ground state within the next time unit, let's say next, next, next nanoseconds or so, and emit a photon. So the reason, the result is it's a single exponential. So that's important. It's actually important because in, in, in practical cases, actually it's not a single exponential. So we have to remember this. And so we, we, we have to, to actually to remember what it means if and when the fluorescence decay from, uh, uh, curve is multi-exponential. So what does it tell us? Of course, the fluorescence decay curves, here's a, a blue one and a yellow one, they are different for different fluorophores. That's what everyone knows and what everyone has, has in mind when, when we are talking about fluorescence decay functions. And what normally, what people who are not very used to, with, with not very uh, convenient, uh, not very, very familiar with fluorescence decay functions, they say, oh, that's great. I can use the lifetime to distinguish different fluorophores. That's what normally what, what microscopy people are doing. So, well, the answer is, of course you can do this, but it's not the only way to distinguish between fluorophores. And from my point of view, it's much easier to distinguish fluorophores by, by spectral characteristics, just by taking a spectral image with a camera or taking a spectrum or something like that. So the really inter interesting part is that the fluor fluorophores in different environment have different lifetime. The reason is simply there's interaction of the excited molecule with its molecular environment. And this interaction takes away the excited energy and how quickly and how much of the energy it takes away, of course, depends on the molecular environment. It doesn't it depend so much on the, on the molecule. So it, in other words, the fluorescence lifetime allows us to distinguish the same kind of molecule in different molecular environments. It's an indicator of the molecular environment. So it tells us something about the concentration of biologically relevant ions binding to proteins, conformation and interaction of these proteins with other proteins. And it's especially it becomes interesting when, when we talk about endogenous compounds, which are just, in, which are existing and, and which are always present in, in biological systems, enzymes or coenzymes and proteins and these things. In these kind, in, in these cases, it, it tells us something about of the conformation of the enzymes themselves, it interaction of enzymes with proteins, metabolic state of the whole thing. So this is a lot of information. So this is what's really important. And here are some examples how and why fluorescence decay curves change with a molecular environment. Here is the classic example. This is quinine sulfate. And quinine sulfate changes its lifetime depending on the concentration of chloride ions. The mechanism here is, is normally called collisional quenching. So what happens is the molecule is in the excited state and when it collides with the chloride ion, the chloride ion takes away the energy from the, from the excited molecule. The molecule returns to the ground state. So to make the long story short, the fluorescence lifetime is just reversely proportional to the concentration of the chloride ions. So this is the classic example, but there are many more possibilities of lifetime changes. This is a nice thing, this is rhodamine B. And the fluorescence decay time depends on the temperature. This is a 
sequence of fluorescence decay curves we recorded for the Oranamine B, and here we changed the, uh, the temperature. And the mechanism here is probably that it's it's influence of the solvatation. So the solvent molecules arrange around the fluorophore molecules. There is energy exchange with the solvatation shell and how much and how far it, it solvates depends on the temperature. That's all, and this has an influence of the light. So we will rarely measure temperature by this way in the, in the human eye, but just keep in mind, this is the typical interaction with the solvent. Other things are, most of the fluorescence lifetimes depend on the pH. The mechanism is you have a protonated and a deprotonated form of the fluorophore. And of course, the amount of pro or the, the probability that one of the fluorophore molecules is protonated or not depends, of course, on the pH. You see different decay curves. So there are a lot of other effects which cause lifetime changes. The folding state of the fluorophore itself binding to of the fluorophore to proteins, local viscosity, solvent polarity, energy transfer to other absorbers or other fluorescent molecules, electron transfer, redox potential of the environment, or we can simply say the mechanism is unknown, but the lifetime changes somehow. In, in, in fact, this is enough for us. We know the lifetimes change due to some change in the molecular environment of the, of the of the fluorophores, and this probably and hopefully gives us an indication of the of the state of the of the retina of the fundus of the eye, which we are looking at. So, of course, I already mentioned it at the, at the beginning. There, in biological systems, the decay functions are normally multi-exponential. The reason is that. Why are they multi-exponential? So this is uh, actually, I should, should, before I come to the real reasons, I should uh, raise a warning here. Many people think a fluorophore like this, this is NADH in water, a fluorophore just has a multi-exponential decay. This is actually a contradiction in itself. If this is just NADH and it is one form of NADH and it's in water, it must have a single exponential decay. What it means here is there are either different forms of NADH, slightly different compounds, or they are in different folding states, there are different states of hydration, or whatever, something must be different, and there, as a result, the decay function becomes multi-exponential. So what's the reason? It's the reason is the environment. Other reasons may that we simply have mixtures of different fluorophores. In FLIO, we have a lot of fluorophores, the most important ones. Dietrich Schweitzer knows it better. This is FAD, lipofuscine, uh, advanced glycation, glycation end products, and these things. And by the way, lipofuscine and AGEs are by, itself, by themselves are mixtures of slightly different compounds. But it's not important for us. The, the way these, these compounds are mixed can depend on the probably on a, on a metabolic state of the retina, so we will see a change. The other things are mixtures of geometric configurations of the molecules, stretched, fold, I said this already, protonated, deprotonated forms. And all in all, the, the conclusion is the shape of the decay function changes with the molecular, molecular environment. If you look at this, this is also NADH in water, but I added a little bit citric acid, the pH is four. This is still a little bit sour, but it's, it's by far not something like sulfuric acid. And you see a dramatic change in the fluorescence decay. So we know it, what we have to expect are multi-exponential decays and they change. So which information can we get from the multi-exponential decay? Of course, we have to analyze it in a way that we, we split it in individual components. There's a fast component here. In this is, again, this is this NADH decay curve at pH four. There's 115 picoseconds, there's 320 picoseconds, and there's 3.4 nanoseconds. Fast decay, medium decay, slow decay. In every of these 
decay component is present with a certain amplitude. So what does it tell us? Well, the amplitudes tell us how much of these fluorform, fluorform forms, one, two, three is there. The lifetimes tell us in which, what are the forms and what are they doing there? In which state of interaction with the environment are they? And of course you can get these, the, the, these uh, such changes also in, or you see these then in, in just a, something like a, an average lifetime, but from an average lifetime of the whole thing, it's probably you know the tau m, which is uh, common in flim analysis, but from, from, the, from an average lifetime, if you just fit this with a single exponential decay or something like that, you can only see that something changes. You can't tell what induces the change. Is it the amount of form, way, form A, amount of form three, or if the lifetime changes, you don't know. So if you run a multi-exponential decay analysis and split it into components, you get much more. So that's it. Here's just a, uh, an example why it's so important to, to look at the amplitudes of the decay component. This is NADH, this is FAD. NADH, I should say, it's very important for metabolic imaging, but unfortunately we can't observe it in the human eye. It is certainly there, but it, the, the excitation wavelength is not accessible through the lens of the eye. But nevertheless, NADH and FAD both have a bound and an unbound component, and the ratio of bound and unbound changes with the metabolic state. This is with oxygen present. You have most of the NADH is bound, most of the FAD is unbound. These are decay functions. And if you are in the glycolytic state, which means it's probably a tumor cell, the life, the fluorescence decay curves change. Look at this, I go back. You have distinctly different shape. So that means there's chance that we even can distinguish tumor cells from non-tumor cells, which is really tricky because the, the the changes in, in these cells are not big, it's just a change in the metabolism, but it shows up in the fluorescence decay curves. So, at the end of this section, just an example, a decay curve of the fundus of the human eye, you see how strongly multi-exponential it is, and you also see how fast it is. This is one division here is 250 picoseconds. And I don't know, some of you are probably not so, so familiar with this photophysical things. You know the velocity of the light. Light travels 300,000 kilometers per second. So within these 250 picoseconds, light just travels 7.5 centimeters in air. In the eye, it's less because the refractive index is higher. So you see, how fast these times are, and that we really we are in a range which is a little bit like 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 spaceship Voyager and and uh, application of warp drives something like that. This is interesting. Extremely short lifetimes, multi exponential decay, extremely fast decay components. You see it here on the right. The fastest component is 136 picoseconds. So in other words. It, in the time when this decay components decays, the light travels only about, what is it, three centimeters, something like that. Very fast. So we need extremely high time resolution. We need extremely high timing stability because otherwise we don't get quantitative results. We see that the optical path length matters because 250 picoseconds is only 7.5 centimeters. Other thing is because this is multi-exponential, we have to suppress out of focus detection because you know how difficult it is to split this in three components. If we have out of focus components, we're totally lost. We must suppress them optically. We must suppress scattered light signals. And of course we need high sensitivity because we need many photons and we can't damage the, the eye of the patient. Everything must be done at very low light intensities. So I think this is the first First part about the decay functions. Are there any questions about these, these basic things? So maybe we come to the next part. 
Yes, so let's go on. How are FLIO data recorded? So these are all things I warn you. They, all the many of these uh, items here in the presentations are very technical, but you will see a little bit knowledge about these technical things will allow you to do your job of FLIO measurement and interpretation of FLIO measurement in a much better way, in a more reliable way. So how are FLIO data recorded? So we have a laser. The laser goes through an XY scanner. The scanner is very fast. This is in the, in the Heidelberg engineering scan head. The scanner deflects the laser beam. It goes through a scan lens. This is the, the lens at the output of the scanner. And then it's projected in the eye. So, and as the XY scanner scans the beam, the point where the laser beam hits the fundus, of course, changes. You see this? So the light, which is in the fluorescence light, which is induced in the focus uh, in, in the fundus, goes back. It goes through the scan lens. It goes through the XY scanner. At the uh, on this side of the XY, of the XY scanner, it's stationary again because the scanner hasn't moved very much. And the, during the, the, this few nanoseconds, when the light went back and forth, it passes a filter which splits the emission light from the excitation light. Here's a lens. The lens projects the fluorescence light into a pinhole. And by this pinhole, you select just a little area here around the excited spot and put this on the detector. This pinhole is very important because you want that you, that you, you, you have a lot of, of scattered light in the eye. You have fluorescence in the, in the cornea and in the, in the lens of the eye. So you want to suppress this, this light. And only the light from the, this is not quite correct, but it's almost correct, only the light which is induced on the fundus goes back through the pinhole and reaches the detector. So here's the, the, a question which is normally not, not addressed. So why actually are we using scanning for FLIO? Why is Heidelberg engineering using scanning? And this, many people don't know that. Some people think that scanning is just a, 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 something like a, an emergency solution to get the images because cameras don't work or whatever. But the, the answer is scanning gives much better images than a camera-like detection device. Because as I said, it suppresses out of focus light light from here is not focused into the pinhole and only a very small fraction of light, which is, for instance, emitted by the, by the lens or by the cornea, only a, a very light fraction of this light can reach the detector. And even more importantly, it, the pinhole and this, this uh, scanning procedure suppresses lateral scattering. If you have, if you illuminate the whole object, in this case, the whole fundus, and try to detect an, a fluorescence image by a camera, you get, in every pixel, you get scattered light from all the other pixels because they are all illuminated. This is not the case if you scan. You put the light only on this pixel and you detect from this pixel. The other pixels are dark. So you have far less influence of lateral scattering in the scanning procedure. And the, the fourth advantage is actually that the scanning procedure is perfectly compatible with our multidimensional TCSPC process. So this is scanning, and this is why we are scanning. In reality, the Heidelberg engineering system is a bit more complicated. There's also compensation of the, of the eye movement, you know, no human patient can can keep his or her eye steady on one point for longer than a few seconds. So this eye motion is detected and compensated in the data. But this is not so important. What you should know is we are scanning because we are suppressing out of focus light by scanning and we are suppressing lateral scattering so we get much better images. So how are we detecting the fluorescence decay curves and the images? Here's the principle. 
it's actually a combination of our multidimensional TCSPC process with the laser scanning ophthalmoscope. Here's the ophthalmoscope. This is the FLIO scanner, a bit schematical. Here's the eye, here's the laser. So the laser goes into the scanner. The scanner scans the fundus of the eye by the principle I showed before. The fluorescence light comes back and it comes, all the optics is in the, in the scanner. It, it, it passes, the, the fluorescence light passes an optical fiber and ends up finally on our detector. So this is a photon counting detector, a very sensitive one. And for every photon, which is arriving here, the detector delivers a tiny electrical pulse. The pulse is very short, very fast, but it's measurable. So what we are then doing is we have this pulse and we measure the time of this pulse. That means the time of the photon in the laser pulse sequence. We have a reference signal which comes from the laser. So here's the laser pulse. A little bit later, we have a photon, we measure this time. At the same time, we get synchronization pulses from the scanner and from these synchronization pulses, we determine where on the fundus the laser beam was in the moment of the photon detection, exactly in this moment. And then the rest is actually easy. Technically, it's not easy, but this principle is easy. We build up a photon distribution over X and Y and the time of the photon in the fluorescence decay curves. And this is actually our photon distribution. And this is, it's actually the raw data of our, of our FLIO image. So a bit more in detail to what happens. We're detecting a photon at this time. And at, the, at this position, we're detecting another photon. We're detecting more photons and more photons and more photons until we have to filled we detected a lot of photons and filled the whole photon distribution with photons. So what we have here is actually our lifetime image. Or it's actually the pre-stage of this lifetime image. The advantage is, well, this works with near ideal photon efficiency. It's not only ideal sensitivity in terms that, that every photon is detected. We also get very clean fluorescence decay curves from which we very efficiently can derive the fluorescence lifetime and the fluorescence decay parameter. We have an excellent time resolution. This comes from this detection process. The time of this of, of for photon detection here can be, be determined with very high precision with the detector we have in FLIO. The, the precision of this detection is about 100 picoseconds. Even more importantly, we'll have an excellent timing stability. We'll see this later. What we need is actually a timing stability for better than 50 picoseconds. And this process is able to reach this. We have no problem with the fast scan rates of the FLIO. You just to give you some numbers there, if, if, uh, if, if Eco is around, he knows the numbers maybe a bit better. But I think the FLIO scanner scans something like, like 16 or 20 frames per second, and every of these frames is scanned with 500 by 500 pixels. So the pixel time is far shorter than a microsecond. So it's, it's probably 100 nanoseconds or so on one pixel. No problem with this fast scan rate because it's just implicit to this procedure. When we detect the photon, we look where the scanner was and we look Look when the photon came. This the process is independent of the scan speed. And in fact, it's a combination of the most accurate technique of resolving signals in space and in time. That's you can just bring it down to, to this statement. And here's another thing which I should mention. You it can happen that you from time to time you get confronted be, with non-experts of TCSPC flim and they always talk about the so-called pile up problem this is pile up is a terrible word it's they some people think okay there's pile up this is a terrible thing and pile up makes the fluorescence decay measurements just wrong so what are they understanding under pile up so pile up is 
the possibility, I say the possibility, that in one laser pulse period, we don't detect only one photon, but two or more. What will happen? We, this process can detect only one photon. The other ones are lost. And if we are losing photons later, we we'll detect one, and after that we are losing a photon, of course we would de uh, detect the wrong fluorescence decay. But you know it, the count rates, photon count rates in FLU are, we are lucky if we get something like one or two megahertz count rate. The excitation pulse rate of the laser is 80 megahertz. So there's almost no chance that we get a second photon here and no pileup problem. That's all. So just, I don't think that the pileup problem is a problem in the clinical community, but if you publish something in a Journal of Biomedical Optics or in, in uh, whatever non-clinical uh, non journal, it can happen that the reviewers come up with a pileup problem and then you remember it's not a real problem. And if you need the right harsh answer to the reviewer, then pass it to me and I will give him the answer he deserves. Okay, fine. What's next? Okay, I actually, I simplified a little bit too much because I show a flim image here and it is actually, I make, it makes the impression that the flim image is the direct result of this recording process. Of course, it's not what we are detecting here is this photon distribution. And I should give you an impression of, of how this photon distribution looks like. And here is a photon distribution. This is what you see here. This is X, this is Y. And all these peaks here represent one pixel of this, of this, of this scan data. Every peak is one pixel. And every peak just represents the fluorescence decay function, which we measured in this pixel. And you see actually how ugly these data are looking like. It's now a matter of data analysis to produce a beautiful lifetime image from this photon distribution. So actually this shows how important a good fluorescence decay or a, a good lifetime analysis is to produce very really good images. So how are we doing this? Just briefly at the beginning, what is the task of data analysis? We have to determine the decay parameters in the individual pixels. So let's assume we're in this pixel, we have a fluorescence decay function there. The task is now create an image which displays the desired decay parameter, which one this is. I can come, come back to this in a moment. What you do is you fit these decay data. So this is the fluorescence decay curve and this is a photon distribution by itself. It's a photon distribution over time in the fluorescence decay and nothing else. So you fit this with a suitable model. What the suitable model is, is actually a problem in FLEO. We'll come back to this. So you fit it and by from this fit, of course, you can do several, several things. You can just, determine something like an average lifetime. Usually we analyze our data with three exponential components, as I showed it at the beginning. You can derive from this data something like a mean lifetime, this TM, uh, probably you, you worked with this TM earlier, and we call it the amplitude weighted average lifetime. And then if we have these TMs, we just paint this image with a color which corresponds to the measured TM. And you see it's different here, it's different in the fovea, it's different in the optical disc. This gives the typical lifetime image. But of course, as I said at the beginning, the TM doesn't tell us everything. It's, it doesn't tell us the full story. It's easily possible that the real information is in the decay components, in the amplitudes A and the times T. So, of course, the fluorescence decay analysis is able to give us also lifetime images of these components. Here is a lifetime image, which shows us the lifetime of the fast decay component T1, 
you see it's it's pretty fast. It's in the range between zero and three hundred picoseconds. We'll assume that that we are this is yellow, this is reddish, just here in the middle. We are somewhere in in the range of 150 to 200 picoseconds. Here's the lifetime of this second. Here, I, I, this is actually a bit wrong. I said slow component. We have three components. This is the, the medium component. This is, of course, slower, but we get also a lifetime dimension. Slow component. OK, we can also look at the, at the amplitude, how much of this fast fluorescence do we have? And how much of the slow or, or second slow or second fastest component do we have? These are the amplitudes. These are different images. And this is different biological information. This is, these are independent parameters of the decay functions. And they can mean, tot in terms of, of clinical results, it can mean totally different things. What they mean, I can't perfectly tell you. And probably you can't tell me as well. We have to find it out. This is the big chance in FLIR. So the question is, how are these decay parameters determined? I said, we just fit the decay curves with a suitable model. So uh, this, this, leaves, uh, this sentence actually leaves a lot of things open and doesn't tell how exactly it's done. So the problem actually is, if we can call it a problem, or the challenge is, well, the shape of this photon distribution, this is this is a FLIO curve from one pixel. The shape of this photon distribution does, of course, not exactly represent the fluorescence decay function because for the simple fact, fluorescence is excited by a laser pulse of non-zero width and the fluorescence is detected by a detector of finite speed. So the reason is, you see it here, normally, the if I have an infinitely short detector, a laser pulse and a fast detector, this should go instantly up and then should go down. It, so it goes up a little bit slowly, more slowly. And that means, we, in, in terms of mathematics, we have to say the measured waveform is a convolution of the real decay curve with an instrument response function. And the instrument response function is the curve the system would recur, record for an infinitely fast fluorescent lifetime. So the convolution integral. What is convolution? The mathematician will tell you, well, this is convolution, this wonderful integral. Tells you a lot, isn't it? <laughs> I admit. It tells nothing to me. Let's take just a look what it means. So let's assume we have a laser pulse. This is the laser pulse, and it, it, it's expected to excite fluorescence. So then we can say, OK, the laser pulse has a given width. It's not infinitely short. But we can say the laser pulse is broken up in a large number of subpulses which come here with different delay and with different amplitude. So the envelope of these, all these little pulses is the real laser pulse. And then we can say, well, every laser pulse, every subpulse excites a fluorescence decay with different amplitude and different delay. And if we sum this up, we get this waveform. And this waveform is the convolution of the real fluorescence decay with this laser pulse. This is what this integral actually says. So this is the waveform of the fluorescence excited by the laser, but we still haven't measured it. So we take this, this, this waveform arrives at the detector. The detector has also a response like this. We do the same thing. We say that our detector response is broken down into these little subpulses. Every this of these subpulses will record a waveform which represents this. The waveforms are a little bit shifted, all because the pulses here are shifted, and the result is this. This is the recorded signal, and what what we do in practice is this. As a mathematician, you see immediately that the convolution operation is commutative. So we can say, okay, whether we convolute 
the real fluorescence decay first with the laser pulse and then with the detector pulse and get the right result, or whether we first convolute this with this and then convolute and call this an ins instrument response function, laser pulse plus detector pulse. And we convolute our fluorescence decay with this instrument response function. This is directly e equivalent. So for simplicity, we say we have an instrument response function with the convolution of the laser pulse and the detector pulse. And this is convoluted with a real fluorescence and gives a measured waveform. This is what this integral is telling us. So this is good. So we can determine which waveform we would record for a given fluorescence decay function. But this is actually the wrong way. But what we need is convolution. And there we have a new problem, because if we have a measured decay function and, a flu and a, an instrument response function, IRF, there is no reversal of the, decon of, of the convolution operation. It's not possible. The convolution integral cannot be analytically reversed. Exceptions are a few very special cases of the instrument function and of the fluorescence decay function, but we can say in practice this cannot be reversed. So what does the scientist do if there's such a problem? Of course, he resorts to three procedures. That's what you have done and what we are doing now in, in SPC image data analysis software. We have I think it's around for, for more than 20 years now. And everyone, probably everyone of you, knows the least square fit. So what you're doing in the least square fit, we have our model function. This is this red curve. We have the photon numbers in subsequent time channels of our fluorescence decay. Then we determine all these differences between the the photon numbers in the model function, square them, add them up, and optimize the, the model function until least this least square, this, this, this sum of the squares reaches a minimum. So that's what we're doing. But it doesn't work very well. Here's an example. This is a fluorescence decay with 6,800 photons. Beautiful result, 1,950 picoseconds. Okay, we reduce the intensity. 850 photons in this curve, the same fluorescence. What are we getting? 1,820 picoseconds. Hmm. We don't like this. And if we go down to 190 picoseconds, we get 1,590 picoseconds as a fluorescence decay time. So this is actually terrible because the last thing we want is a dependence on our, of our lifetime determination on the photon on the photon rate or on the photon number in the in the image because everything what we're doing here is actually based on the assumption that the fluorescence lifetime is independent of the intensity. So what's the reason of these different towers? Crazy. No one is talking about this, but actually everyone should know it. So the, here's the problem. The, the least square fit minimizes the square error sum. This is this. This is the photon number minus the, the model function at this in this time channel squared and summed up. So this sounds good, but we have a problem. The photon numbers n here, these are the these red dots in the time channels, actually they follow a poor sum distribution. And you see it immediately, the noise here is smaller than the noise here. So, and if we have very low intensities, the noise goes down to zero. The noise, in, in other words, the noise, which we have in, in this curve, depends on the n number of, of photons in the particular channel on n itself. And strictly spoken, the, the standard deviation is sigma is the square root of n of the photon number in this channel. So this, of course, if we just fit this, 
with a constant weight, the result will be disappointing. So the problem is normally solved by weighting these, the error sum. And in other words, the weight for channels with lower n must be higher because they are, the, the absolute amount of noise here is, is less than here. And, but we have, you immediately have a problem because if you look at this, this square root n dependence, the correct weight, weighting factor should be one over square root n. So what happens if we have no photon in the channel? Then this goes to infinity. So the whole thing is impossible for, for we can't weight channels with n, n equals zero. And because we can't, this is basically impossible to take the Poisson distribution into account correctly, we get this dependence on the, on the, on the photon number. So, in other words, we need a better fit algorithm. And there is indeed one. This is a bit complicated now, but I, just for fun, I will tell you, this is the, the maximum, or, um, the maximum, it's called maximum, sorry, I'm get con getting confused because on my screen, always some features from Zoom are, are showing up and obscuring actually my my screen, so I have problems to to explain what we are seeing here. So okay, maximum likelihood estimation. Many people on this planet talk about MLE, MLE maximum likelihood estimation, and they know exactly how good it is and how important it is, but usually they don't know how it works. So I will tell you how it works here, just in case you are asked what MLE is, and if you know what it is and what the, what the, how the algorithm works, you can make a huge impression on other people. So that's important. I would always like that my FLEO colleagues make a huge impression on other people. So, good. Here's an example. The red curve is our model function. It's a fluorescence model. In the simple case, it's the simplest case, it's just the, the single exponential decay function. The blue crosses are the photon numbers in the time channel. So this is a time channel, this is a time channel, time channels. And of course, these, they vary randomly. They are not exactly on our model function. So what can we do? We have our model function. We say, okay, in this time channel, my model function shows me a certain value. This, and then we can say, okay, this is actually the value which I expect for the number of photons here. But the, the photons come randomly, they don't follow exactly this expectation value. But what I can do is I can set up an equation for the photon distribution for, for, for the Poisson distribution, which has exactly this expectation value. So this is the photon distribution for this expectation value. And then I take the true photon number projected on the Poisson distribution and can find out how probable is it that I get exactly this photon number in a Poisson distribution, which has this expectation value and vice versa it's actually the probability that this point in our model function fits somehow to this measurement result, to this photon number in the time channel. And I can do this for all time channels. Here, 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 here. And what I then do is I get all these probabilities. I multiply the probabilities and with this, this multiplication, I get a probability that the fluorescence, my, my hypothetical fluorescence decay, the model function fits to my data. This is, this is what the MLE fit does. And what we simply do is we have this probability and then we optimize the model parameters of the decay functions until the product of all these probabilities is a maximum. The, the advantage is the MLE correctly takes into account the Poisson distribution of the photon numbers, and it has no problem if the photon number is low, and it has even no problem 
is the photon number, if the photon number in some channels is zero, because for a zero photon number, we still get a probability here. It's non-zero. This probability to get a zero photon number in the channel is not zero. So it doesn't mess up our product of all these probabilities. So fine, we can work with this. And here's the example. Here is the this example of, of our fluorescence decay with very low number of photons, 190 photons. You see, it even doesn't look any more like a fluorescence decay. It's, as I always put it, it's a photon distribution. What we see here is, is something like one photon, no photon. There are many channels with where, which have no photons inside, but still we can fit this. But the, the square fit doesn't fit it very well. Wrong lifetime, but the MLE fit gets the right lifetime, 1,960 picoseconds. And if we go back to this, compared to this 1,950 1, for 6,800 photons, so the MLE fit gets almost, this is some statistical error, gets the same lifetime at low photon number. So that's the, that's the, the difference compared to uh, uh, earlier SPC image versions. And it works better. It gives a more stable result. It works faster. And it has a few other benefits, which I have no time to talk about. So an important question. What's statistic? I said, yeah, of course, if you look at the fluorescence decay from the same fluorophore, even with the sa same average number of photons, you don't always get the same lifetime because it's statistics. So what is the statistical accuracy of a lifetime calculated from such data? And I must say uh, a readily available mathematical theory is about this is not available, but we can do something. At least we can estimate it. And we can make an estimation based on the average arrival time of the photons. So here's a fluorescence decay. These, again, the blue dots are photons in the time channels. And from this the fluorescence decay, we can calculate what the average arrival time of all these photons was. It's called the first moment. It's just something like this. Relatively easy to understand. And if we take this first moment or the average arrival time and subtract from it the time of the IIF, or more accurately, I should say, the first moment of the IIF, the result is the fluorescence lifetime. Plain and easy. So you may ask why we are not always using this first moment calculation for FLIM or FLIO analysis. There's a simple answer. It works only for single exponential decays. And if we have a multi-exponential decay, it gives us the lifetime of a single exponential approximation. So that's not what we want. But from this average arrival time, we can estimate the signal to noise ratio of the fluorescence lifetime obtained this way. It's actually relatively easy. It's a, in, I don't want to, to bore you with mathematics here. It's also not my style. I'm not very good in mathematics. But the, there's one thing. It's the property of the E function, of the exponential function. The, the, if the, the photon density here is actually follows an exponential function, e to minus x. And the, the average, the, 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 the standard deviation of these photon times, if they are single exponentially distributed, is, again, this is a property of the, of the E function, is tau. So our standard deviation of these times is tau. And if we have n photons, number of n photons in the whole decay curve, OK, then the, standard, the, the, the noise goes down with the square root of n, which means the signal to noise ratio, the relative standard deviation, 
of the fluorescence lifetime in the fluorescence decay is the square root of n. Plain and simple. And it's so important that I show it once more in big letters here. Remember, the signal to noise ratio of the fluorescence lifetime is square root of n. We can't do better than this. If we make mistakes, it will be worse. But if we do everything perfect, we have a signal to noise ratio of the lifetime of the square root of n. And TCSPC and proper data analysis comes very close to this value. So, okay, almost at the end of this section. So what does it tell us? If you want to get better lifetimes, the only way we can go is to increase n, the number of photons in the, fluoresc in the fluorescence decay curves, number of photons in the pixels, or number of photons in the whole image. Do we have many options? Okay, we can record longer. Not very convenient for the patient. What else? How can we maximize n? And here's one thing which is really important, and this means focus correctly. Remember how the FLIR instrument works. The light from the fundus goes back through the scanner through a pinhole on the detector. And if we have poor focusing, image is defocused, then of course the light from here, from this large spot, doesn't pass the pinhole. Only a, large, a small part of it will reach the detector. In comparison to this, correctly focused, all light from this spot will reach the detector. And the, 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 it's interesting, if you defocus, the resolution may be only slightly impaired. You still see a relatively good image, but the loss in sensitivity or number of photons in the image can be large. Here's an example from microscopy. You see here, this image was slightly defocused. It still has a good image definition. You don't see much loss in resolution, but nevertheless, we have a 50% loss in photon number here by poor focusing. 50% loss in photon number means actually you have to record twice as long to get the same accuracy. And you have to, to actually to, to, to put the, the patient twice as long on the, on the scanner. You have to sit in front of the scanner twice as long. This is, this is not what we want. So very important, focus correctly. The second thing is, and this is really surprising, don't record background counts. Background counts are poison for the fluorescence decay analysis. This is really crazy. Here again, an example from microscopy. I, I would love to have an, an example of uh, from FLIO, and I'm sure there is <laughs> certainly a lot of, of FLIO results which contain background, but I, have to, to any, I don't have anything available. So again, microscopy image. This has 10% background. You see here the contrast is slightly impaired, but it just uh, looks okay. In the fluorescence decay curve C, you see about 10% background. This is the same recording, same sample with no background. The fluorescence decay curves generally look the same as here, except, except for the fact that you have less background. But if you analyze these images, and look for the accuracy of tau. Here is the distribution of the taus over this image. The width of this distribution is 313 picoseconds. The width width of this distribution is 144 picoseconds. So that means by avoiding this only this 10% of background, our result increased by a factor of two in signal to noise ratio. And actually from here to here, this decrease of accuracy by the background is equivalent to a loss of 75% of the photons. You remember, this is always the square root n dependence. So why is there such a dramatic effect? I, I, I think I, I owe you an explanation for that. The explanation is simply, the timing variance for the background photons is larger than 
the time invariance for fluorescence photons. If you look at single photons, so I said in, at the beginning when I explained you the square root n dependence, the timing variance of the photons within the fluorescence decay is tau. Let's assume tau is a nanosecond or so. In FLIO, it's even worse. In FLIO, it's shorter than a few hundred picoseconds. But this from here to here is 12 nanoseconds. So our 10, these 10% 10 of, of background photons have a timing variance, which is, okay, it's about half the width of this window is five nanoseconds, but the timing variance of our, of our fluorescence photons is only a few hundred picoseconds. So the, in other words, the background introduces much more, a, background, a single background photon introduces much more timing variance in the result than the normal fluorescence photons do. That's the reason why this is so bad. So be careful, keep out background counts. I can only emphasize this, make everything extremely dark, put a black cloth over the instrument and over the patient, put an umbrella over the whole thing, close the, close the window blinds, everything, it, it must be absolutely dark. If you see anything like background, you know you're losing accuracy. So, questions to this part. So, okay, let's go to add the challenges of FLIO analysis. And this is actually the, the section, which is the really interesting one, at least it's the interest, interesting one for me. And I hope I can also make it exciting a bit for you. So, challenges of FLIO analysis. I think most of you, are familiar with that, but the problem is just you have to, you have to to develop a clear idea what where really the basic problems are and where we have to seek seek for solutions. So the first thing is of course we have extremely fast decay components, and as Dietrich Schweitzer found out, even the extremely fast decay components have a clinical meaning. So we, sometimes we are finding a fast decay component T one of 80 picoseconds. This is incredibly short. And this is shorter than, than some other FLIM systems even have, have the possibility to resolve in very simple setups like, like microscopy setups or, so, or in cuvette. Cuvette's 80 picoseconds is, is really by itself is a challenge. So here's just a normal image. It's multi-exponential. This is a challenge and the decay components are extremely fast. So this image, here is a typical decay curve somewhere in this image. And here is the distribution of the, actually of the TM lifetime. And you see even the TM is around 100, 150 picoseconds, it's terribly short. So we have to analyze this. The second thing is, we don't know exactly what the IRF is. I will make this clear a little bit later. So, of course, the advice is usually we have to measure the IRF, but we will see that this is not exactly possible. And even worse, we don't know exactly where the IRF is. Here's our scanner. There's the patient with the eye. And the distance between the eye and the scanner can vary. Let's assume it varies by one centimeter back and forth, this gives a delta T of 60 picoseconds. This is huge. We want to make, uh, we want to, to reliably measure 80 picoseconds, but if we have 60 picoseconds delta T, everyone in the world would say impossible. Okay, we are engineers. Engineers say, okay, here's a problem. Let's look for solutions. Let's find out the options and implement it. So, and the third one is actually, we don't know exactly what the decay model is. What is this? Dietrich Schweitzer knows it. And Dietrich Schweitzer has suggested it at least 10 years ago together with me, but no one believed us. So I hope now I can make people believe Dietrich and me. So, okay, first, extremely fast decays. So of course, with our, with, with our detection technique and, and analysis technique, we have no problem at all to 
to, to determine lifetimes and lifetime components of about 50 picoseconds, even shorter than these 80 picoseconds. But there is an if. If an IRF of the correct shape is used, and if we know where the IRF is, but we don't know this. So here's an example, a video image analyzed with the correct IRF. Just give me time to explain where we get this correct IRF from. Maximum of the, of the distribution, lifetime distribution TM, this is the conventional TM, 260 picoseconds. So and here, just for demonstration, must shift something away on my screen because I can't see my own slides anymore. <laughs> it's always flipping around. All this zoom information is crazy. Okay, can you turn off these these windows from for for Michael, Eric, and and Eco because they are actually empty, but they are blocking my screen. Okay, good. So here on the right side. I just deliberately shifted the IRF by 50 picoseconds. Only 50 picoseconds, 50 picoseconds left. And my lifetime distribution shifted to 380 picoseconds. So the difference in tau m is 120 picoseconds, only by shifting the IRF by 50 picoseconds. Wow, this is a lot. So we need a solution for that. Uh, what normally is suggested is we have to measure the IRF. Okay, to make it short, ECO probably invested weeks and months in measuring IRFs, and all the time it turned out it wasn't exactly the right IRF or, or it didn't work with these IRFs. Actually, it was a never ending story. And here are some reasons why this doesn't work very well. So, this is again, again the setup of our scanner. How can we measure the IRF? We can put a scattering target here. Then the laser goes into this target, it's scattered back, and it goes down the detection beam pass, but here's a filter. It blocks the light of this wavelength, so we have to take out the filter. Taking out this filter already changes the detection beam pass. It can in, it even introduce, if this filter is thick, it can introduce a, a, an IRF shift by a few, of a few uh, five or 10 picoseconds. So it's a problem. Take out the filter. Even if we take it out, we have a problem because in the target, we have multiple scattering and this broadens the IRF. Keep in mind, we have to do with, with timing effects here, which are on the, on the order of 50 picoseconds. And 50 picoseconds contribution from scattering is easy to reach. So it doesn't work very well. Should we use fluorescence of extremely short lifetime? There is no such fluorescence. We can quench something very strongly, but then it becomes very dim and every little bit contamination or even fluorescence from the optic will actually mess up our IRF measurement. We would need a fluorescence lifetime of less than 10 picoseconds. Such things don't exist. And even if we could do this, it wouldn't solve the problem that we don't know where the IF position is. IF position is still unknown. And I, to tell you the truth, the IRF position is actually more important than the IRF shape. So this doesn't solve our problem. So, from where can we get a correct IRF? And here is a solution which we have introduced in the last year or last couple of years. It's always a development process. We call it IRF modeling. So the task is let's generate a synthetic IRF and use it instead of a measured one. And from the beginning, we were convinced that we possibly can generate a synthetic IRF, which is better than a measured one. The task we have to solve is first, we have to find a simple function, if possible, with, which has only one parameter, which resembles the general shape of the real IRF. It should be characterized by only one parameter. Come back to this later. So 
Here is the IRF of a flim system with our gallium arsenide phosphide hybrid detector. This is the detector which is used in FLIO. And here's a function. This is function x time x to minus x, x. And look, it's not exactly the same, but it fits this shape pretty well. Not too bad. So what's the strategy? We take this function, modify it a little bit so that it becomes a function of time. So this is tw is a, a time which character, characterizes the width of this parameter. So we get t over tw multiplied by a e to minus t over tw. So this is this function. And what we're doing then, we run a normal fit of our decay data using this IRF. But in contrast to normal fitting, we include the IRF parameter, the IRF width parameter, this TW, in the fit. So this is one parameter more. It's a bit tricky to fit this. But we can, of course, we can use photon data from a larger area. So we have lots of photon available. So we will get a reasonable TW. When we know the right TW, we have the, IR, the effective IRF, and we can use this IRF for further data analysis. So that's the recipe. Here's an example. I come back to the details of, the, of this synthetic IRF later. Here's a measured IRF, a pretty good one. So as I said, ECO invested a lot of work to get good IRFs. So with these IRFs, we get a fluorescence lifetime of the Fundus T12. I can also here, sometimes I have to, to, to use the results, which I describe later already here. So it, it just don't, don't worry about TM12 as I come to back, back to this later. So with a measured IRF, I get 150 picoseconds. With our synthetic IRF, I get 180 picoseconds. Pretty much of a difference for our standards. But if we look carefully to this data, you see the measured IRF in the residuals of the fit. We see bumps here, deviations, which means can only mean this IRF doesn't is it, 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 actually not quite correct to fit this data. Our synthetic IRF gives perfect residuals, which means this IRF is better. This is probably the synthetic IRF. And if the vice versa, if our residuals are smooth, most likely our lifetime is correct. So the conclusion is the difference is small, but nevertheless, the synthetic IRF yields a better fit and therefore a better lifetime. The better fit has also other, other, other advantages you will see in a second. So synthetic IRF works and is better. But what is the correct position of the IRF on the time, for, time axis? I already showed it. Here's our scanner, here's the eye, and the distance between scanner and eye changes, which also means that the, IR, the, the, the relative position of the IRF and the measured decay data varies. So the data analysis procedure has to try out what the correct position of the IF is. This is, hmm, it's a complicated task. So what can we do? We fit again, we include this shift into a into a, something fit of the of the whole situation. So we fit the data with a correct model. What the correct model is, we'll, I will tell you later. We need a correct model. That means, for now, I say triple exponential model, which will certainly fit the data pretty well. We have the correct IRF shape. This is our synthetic IRF, and we have a shift parameter which shifts the IRF around the shift parameter exists even in SPC image. So it's important that we use the correct model. So we fit this and we get the shift parameter. This is actually position, the position of the IRF. So the question is now, what we did in the past is 
we determine the IRF position once and for all, fixed it, and used this IRF position for the analysis of all pixels. The alternative would be just to leave the IF position floating and pixel by pixel and let it just float and see what we get better, whether we get better data. Let's try this. So the question is fix the IF position before calculation or leave it floating. Important, we have maximum likelihood estimation. Things are a bit or even considerably different for the least square fit. So here's the IF position fixed. What we see is, hmm, we have a slight systematic change of the lifetime across the image. And sorry that I have to say this, this is the diagonal shift is just a shift in the transit time. It must happen somewhere in the scanner caused by a mechanical effect. So, so maybe Eco knows in the meantime what it is, but we can't make it. This is a medical instrument and as a, as a, a medical approbation, we can't simply make changes all the time in this instrument. It is like it is. So we have to change here. This is the distribution of the fluorescence lifetime over the image. This is with the IRF position floating. What happens? We've got an image which doesn't have this shift because it's compensated by this floating IRF. And this is really surprising. Our distribution of the fluorescence lifetime becomes narrower. This is great. So this, it means this result is more accurate than this one. And this is actually surprising because normally, and especially in the least square fit, a floating IRF position leads to a, not only to a terribly slow calculation, it also le leads to a to an massive increase of the, of, the, of the lifetime noise. So the MLE does much better in terms of IRS F, F position than the, the old least square fit did, and it's not slower. And actually, I have to recommend now, after a lot of, of, of tries and experiments, Leave the IRFs floating and use MLA. This is better. So we have made a small step. We have a good IRF position. We get a relatively reliable result. And this could, it looks, you could think that all problems are solved now. But we are engineers. We are looking at the data very correctly, very very exactly, and all problems solved? No, not quite. Some mysteries remain. And Dietrich Schweitzer and Martin Hammer will probably concur. So what did we always see? These are in, in older data and data analyzed with the old models. We always had a poor fit at the rising edge of the fluorescence and at the maximum of the fluorescence. You see here, the residuals are not flat. So a bit more in detail, this is enlarged. You see here, the fluorescence starts too early. You had to fit, and to fit simply, you use an IF which you want. You change the IF, you never, you are never able to fit this rising edge. So vice versa, if we don't obtain a good fit of our data here, we will never get an accurate IF position because this is just um, the position of this IF is just ambiguous. If we shift it a little bit, then maybe this, this part will be fit better, but this becomes worse, never a good fit. And if you have an inaccurate IF position, of course, we will never get accurate lifetimes. So it seems here's a problem. And for many years, FLIO users just assumed, okay, this must be an instrumental effect. We can't do anything against this. It must be the detector or the, or the TCSPC system or whatever. So and there were just solutions. Let's uh, simply let, let's exclude this rising edge from the fit. Of course, then you get in, in the last later part, you get a good fit, but it doesn't mean that your lifetimes become correct. So something is still wrong here. 
Oh. And what's that? Here's a normal video image. Fine. Lifetimes around 200 picoseconds. Another video image, lifetime 180 picoseconds. Okay, good data. Here's a poorly focused image. This is actually the only bad data image I have. Poor focusing. It has a terribly long lifetime. So why is the lifetime so long here? Only by poor focusing? What's going on here? This is a cataract patient. Cataract means the lens of this patient is fogged up. And when it's fogged up, it's also terribly fluorescent. So also extremely long lifetime. The li lifetime here is totally out of range. We don't see the distribution anymore. So this is the question for Mr. Sherlock Holmes. What has a cataract patient in common with a defocused image? Well, the answer of Mr. Sherlock Holmes is, OK, in both cases, we have a larger relative amount of fluorescence from the lens of the eye. If we have not focused exactly, I showed it before, our intensity of the, of the fundus data goes back, which means relatively more fluorescence from the lens of the eye. The cataract patient, more fluorescence from the, from the, from the lens of the eye as well. So what can, next question, what can distort our rising edge? The answer is fluorescence from the lens. So what we are seeing here and what we are, what we are seeing here is probably just a different representation of the same thing, fluorescence from the lens. And this is actually Dietrich Schweitzer. Uh, Dietrich, I hope you are here. I welcome you. And Myself, we have said it many years ago, but nobody believed us. The answer was just, okay, the FLIO instrument is a confocal system and it, it can't detect anything light from anything which is out of focus. This was of course not correct. And especially it was not correct because the intensities which we get from the fundus are relatively low, but the fluorescent intensity of the lens is much higher than that of the fundus. So a little bit of light from the, from the lens of the eye distorts our signal. And the other thing is, of course, it's optical path lengths. The laser goes in, here's the lens, the fluorescence from the lens comes back, and it comes back much earlier than the fluorescence from the fundus is shifted. So, and if we add up these two signals, lens and fundus, we get something like this. We have this step in the response. And this this decay curve actually comes from a recording with an extremely fast detector. To prove this, this hypothesis, we put a fast detector in a FLIR system and not quite surprisingly, we saw this edge. So this is actually, I would say it's clear, it's not only circumstantial <laughs> evidence, it's clear evidence we have to deal with the lens fluorescence. So, what happens again, we have the fundus fluorescence, we have the lens fluorescence, our resulting fluorescence, our detected signal looks like that with this kink in the rising edge. Okay, if we have a somewhat slower detector, we don't see this kink, but we still see a somewhat strange and distorted rising edge. If we try to fit these data with a conventional triple exponential model, it's impossible to get this data fitted because of this kink in the rising edge. It's Im simply impossible. Wherever you shift the IRF, you never get a good fit of this data. So it's shown here. The best fit is probably somewhere here through the rising edge. It's exactly what we have seen in the real data. The rising edge and the maximum are not correctly fit. So the conventional three exponential model does not fit the data correctly. We have an unreliable fit. We have unreliable decay parameters. And even worse, the fit compensates the wrong shape of our decay model with the wrong position of the IRF. And what then happens is that the 
IHF position depends systematically on the amount of lens fluorescence. More lens fluorescence, the step becomes larger, the IHF slips into a different position. That means the decay times, the fundus decay times are determined wrong. It depends on the amount of fluorescence which we see from the lens. So the solution is actually simple. The general solution is simple. We need a model function which includes the lens fluorescence. And actually, we are lucky, we are very lucky. It turns out that the slow component, tau 3, mainly comes from the lens of the eye. So what we can do, we take our component tau 3 and shift it a little bit left. These, this is tau 1 and tau 2, the first two components, they come from the fundus. We know it. In the meantime, we know it. There's a lot of evidence. The slowest component mainly comes from the from the lens of the eye, it's shifted left. So we get a model function, which is something like this. This is fast component, second fastest component, and the slow component is shifted left by, by a time TD3 delay of the, of the third component. And here's something important. If we just try to fit the data with this model and leave TD3 free and try to fit it together with the other parameters, it's very important, uh, very difficult to get to, to get a stable fit. These are too many parameters. And so what we did is we assume that TT3 is constant. It may vary a little bit with the length of the eye, but it's not critical. So we have in all the results, all the data we have, we, we were able to fit the data perfectly with the TT3 between minus 120 and minus 150. Because seconds, this works well for human adults. So, what else? If we run a fit with this, with this, we call it the the shifted component model. We actually we have a nice byproduct. This is the fluorescence from the lens. The green stuff is the fluorescence from the fundus. Okay, then we can say. The average of these two lifetimes, tau 1, tau 2, is the decay function of the fundus. See, then we can define a mean lifetime of these two components and say, OK, this is the mean lifetime of the fundus. In contrast to TM, former TM, which was the mean lifetime of everything. So we have a mean time, mean lifetime of the fundus, TM12, and excludes the decay components from the lens. So let's replace the former TM with TM12 and let's see where it leads us. We'll see it in a short. So summary of this, of, of what I told you so far in this section. What's new? We have a synthetic RF which replaces the measured one. We have a new model function, which includes the er early arrival of the lens fluorescence. And we have a TM12, which extracts the fundus lifetime from the decay data. And it rejects the influence of the lens, of the eye, uh, lens fluorescence from the, from the lifetime images. So now let's use it. How could you know whether Lydia Sauer is here? Lydia, you did a wonderful thing. I'm showing your data now. And actually, your data actually were the breakthrough which allowed us to show that these, these considerations with the shifted component model and the TM12 are actually correct and very useful. So can't see her, Wolfgang. Um, maybe she was but I can't see her now. Maybe it's too early for her. <laughs> okay. So if Lydia is there, good morning, Lydia, and thank you very much for this data. So this is a cataract patient. Analyzed with a traditional model, this is TM. You see, it's totally out of range. Longer than 400 picoseconds. Here's TM12. Delayed shifted component model and only components TM12. 
T1, T2. This is the weighted average of it. And what are we getting? From this totally blurred image, we suddenly get a lifetime image, which looks like a lifetime image of the fundus. And even the, the times are reasonable. Look here, this is the, the distribution is centered around 250 picoseconds. These are normal fundus lifetimes. Great. And it becomes even better. Because what Lydia did is, this was a patient, these data were recorded before these, this patient obtained a cataract surgery. He, be, he obtained the surgery, cataract surgery means his natural eye lens was replaced with an artificial one. The artificial one is not fluorescent. And what happens, this is before surgery, TM12. This is post-surgery TM. Can you tell the difference? Same lifetimes. So T, the conclusion is TM12, even in a cataract patient with a lot of, of lens fluorescence, represents the fundus image. This is great. Again, thank you, Lydia. So the same thing applied to a healthy patient. I see out some data from the few data I have of a, of a young patient, 24, 25 years old. Such young patients have very little lens fluorescence. But nevertheless, this is TM. This is TM12. This is, these are all lifetime components to average together. This is the fundus lifetime, expectedly. TM maximum 250 picoseconds. TM12 is around 180 picoseconds. It's substantially shorter. So we must be aware of the fact that former fundus lifetimes, even of healthy patients, are 20 to 40% too long because they contain lens fluorescence. And here's another idea. We, it has always been observed that the, that the fear lifetimes, that means fundus, inter, in, interpreted as, as fundus lifetimes, this is fear lifetimes increased with age of the patient. And this may in part be caused by simply not by, by, by increased lifetimes of the fundus, but by increased amount of lens fluorescence. So my suggestion was seek out the old data and look at them with a new model. So a few more tests here and, and interesting things. This is again, a cataract patient, the conventional three exponential model versus shifted component model. So here, actually, we checked what happens with the, F, with the IF position. In this old model, okay, you see immediately, this is the distribution of the lifetime. So obviously, this is for someone who, who is familiar with data analysis, we see immediately here that the FIT algorithm had problems to find the correct IF position. It found different positions for different, uh, different I, I should say different IF times for different locations in the image. Floating IF didn't work. A shifted component model with a floating IF, perfect. Fundus lifetime 220 picoseconds. Here, this, this maximum, even if I seek out TM12 from this data, it's 450 pic uh, picoseconds. It's wrong. And you also see there's an imperfect fit of the rising edge. It's much better here. It, yeah, if position was undefined here, it's correctly defined. The lifetime here is undefined and too large. Here is correct. So former fundus lifetimes of cataract patients, again, may be up to 400% too long. If we didn't, because we didn't, didn't separate it correctly from the lens fluorescence. Here's the same thing, conventional model with the lifetime fixed. Then we got a, a better TM distribution. The, it couldn't shift the IF around because the, the shift was fixed compared with a shifted component model. But you see, still, this is 460 picoseconds and the right lifetime is 220 picoseconds. Again, cataract patients, old lifetimes are too long. 
So, and here's also something which I would like to mention explicitly. The new analysis procedure of procedures of CUMOS work also on old data. These are data of an AMD patient, which I got from Dieter Schweitzer and Martin Hammer almost 10 years ago. This is the old TM image. This is a TM12 image. Of course, the lifetime distribution shifted to shorter values because we excluded the lens fluorescence. Here, the average TM was 180 picoseconds. The average TM12 is 100 picoseconds, very short. And you may say, okay, this looks like a different image, but if I change the time scale, this is this time scale is 0 to 1000 picoseconds. And I compared with a TM12 image on a time scale of 0 to 600 picoseconds, you see almost the same image. So also here, we get a shorter lifetime by excluding the lens fluorescence. And it works on old data. So, okay, I think this was a large part and maybe the part which may be most controversial, but nevertheless, questions and coughing. So these were the questions we answered now, I hope so. And the next part of the lecture is, this is actually about how to do all these things with SPC image data analysis. I made this, this last part a little bit bigger because I noticed that some people expected that I just give an introduction into data analysis and, and data analysis software here. So I, there is no time and I, it's also not my style. I won't show you how to have to click the button in the SPC image analysis. I will just show you the principles of this analysis and how you can manage to use SPC image NG to do exactly the things we have discussed up to now. So SPC image NG, NG means next generation. This is really a uh, a uh, new data analysis package, which has a lot of, of add-ons and improvements. So as you see here, it has it is a combination of time domain and phaser plot, where you could, could potentially be useful for, for FLIO as well. MLE fit of the decay data, shifted component model, IRF modeling, and parallel processing by a GPU, graphics processing unit, which makes the calculation much, much faster. I come back to this later. So anyway, I want to give you a tour through all function of SPC image data analysis that would take a few hours by itself. So if you're interested in details, look into the TC SPC handbook, eighth edition. There is a 60 pages chapter or something about SPC image data analysis. This is the first page. So just a few points. SPC image has different appearances like this, or this, or this, or this. This is something new to you. You can combine it with a phaser plot. Here's a phaser plot of, a, of, of, of the Funtus of I, also interesting. This is another two-dimensional plot. This is for people who are more interested in fluorescence decay functions. And this is maybe confusing, the recommended setups for FLIO I have shown here. You should select this white screen adapted, adapted option, image size variable, small icons, and default met method MLE. If you do this, you will end up approximately in the configuration which I'm showing here. So, model parameters are very important. Here are some set, setting, settings which should not be used for FLIO analysis. Not, not. Don't use the uh, weighted least squares. Don't use fixed sh shift before calculating images. Don't use if shift is fixed, start from peak of fluorescence. This was to exclude the rising edge from the fit. And Yes, again, before calculating images, move the cursor to T1 to peak and then fix. This is the same thing. It is for use with the old model. In, in, in principle, it's, it just hides the problem of fitting the, the leading edge. 
So don't use these options. So a few other things, show intensity images in parallel with, with lifetime images, there's no relevant FLIR information. It's not necessary to do this. Use, don't use weighted least squares fit, use MLE and don't disable the GPU if you have one. You can disable it here to just in, to, to avoid problems in case the, the GPU doesn't work. So, okay. Simple process of analyzing data. Most of you probably know this is no, actually not much point to, to go into details here. Use the import fu function, select the data file, click on open, and it will be imported. So fine. So you may ask why this important uh, importing data doesn't work automatically from the from the Heidelberg engineering software. The reason is just patient safety or something like that. Quality management. The, if, if we do this, the SPC image data analysis would be part of the Heidelberg system. And there is a huge, a, a, a huge overhead in for testing and and uh, just in, uh, getting evidence that the results are stable and and correct in terms of of, uh, of diagnosis of uh, of diseases or such things. So this is terrible. So this could not be done even if we are able to do it technically for just for administrative reasons could be done. You have to import the data explicitly. So after importing, you see the life, uh, you see the intensity image here. Data imported but not analyzed. So, in principle, you can calculate the decay matrix. That means the lifetime image in a selected channel or in both channels at this point. But I wouldn't suggest to do this, at least not uh, if you start the first time, because first you have check to check that you would use the right options and model parameters. So. Basic model definitions. I showed this image before. Three components. This is for the for the fast component, second fast component, slow component. So fine. Advanced model definitions. We have an incomplete multi-exponentials uh, uh, option. You should turn this on because some fluorescence from the previous pulses is remaining here and the data analysis should take this into account. If you don't do, do this, you get a slightly shorter value of, for slow lifetime components. This is for the delayed component model. Tau three is shifted left by 150 picoseconds. You can change this here. If you have a, a patient with small eyes, it's more maybe rather 120. If the eyes are very large, it could be up to 180. Anything we didn't see anything different so far. So IF definition set to x multiplied by by e to minus x. Other model definitions. This is the laser pulse which width, which is I didn't mention this to make it simple laser pulse which is, is included in the IF calculation. You have a laser pulse which with you have this this uh, uh, TW parameter, which par width parameter for the for the IRF and you have the position of the IRF. And if you have loaded data and if you have selected the right model, you can click these adjust buttons and adjust these values independently. An important thing is click this, this button permanently set IRF to this value, then it won't change anymore. And as long as you analyze data, which are only from your instrument, you can leave it as it is. Of course, if you import data from another instrument, then you have to set the, the corresponding value for this instrument, or you just use the adjust buttons to adjust it once more. So this one remark, the FLIR instrument has two channels and when both wavelength channels are loaded, you have separate IF definitions for the two wavelength channels. This is, of course, necessary because the IFs in the channels may be slightly different. So we have done this. And the question is, is everything okay, okay now? I would suggest 
to take a look at the residuals with a new model, with a new IIF, you should get residuals which are very smooth, like this. That means we have the correct model parameters, we have the correct IIF, and the calculation will deliver accurate and reproducible results. If we have bumps in the residuals, it means either the model parameters are not correct, wrong model is selected, the IIF parameters are not correct. And in this case, my recommendation is check the parameters, IIF model, check the check what you said there and find out why this part doesn't fit, fit correctly. So if this is all done, everything okay, then let's run calculate and we get the lifetime image. So that's the procedure. What I have displayed here is again, my, my much loved TM12, which is which I presume to show the fundus lifetime. So what else? Yeah, before you start, get a GPU. That is really important. If the GPU is just a card, you put it in your computer, it's just a, a $200 investment and it processes 512, uh, even this, this cheap one, processes 512 pixels in parallel. is one to 100 or even more. So just to give you an impression of this, this is difference between a man riding on horseback and a Boeing 747. I leave it up to you, leave, leave it to you, whether you like riding on horse, horseback or whether you fly in the in the jumbo jet. I prefer the jumbo jet. I wouldn't like to, to take the horseback. So very important, get the GPU. So next question. Which lifetime do we want to display? We talked a lot, a lot of these things about tau m and tau, tau m12. The, I'm seeing something here. So tau m is in principle, if you use the new models, everything new, and you use tau m, the result is the equivalent of the FLEO lifetimes which were obtained in the past 10 years. Only with a better reliability, less systematic variations, less noise, and a better fit stability. So if you don't trust the TM12, just do everything as recommended here and use the TM. So the other one is the TM12. You can select here under coding of, coding of, 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 of the value you want to display. This is TM12. Consists of these, these two components. There's a third lifetime, and this is an intensity weighted lifetime. It intensity weights all the components, but the weight is not by the amplitude, it's by the intensities. That means by the areas under the curves. And of course, this intensity weighted lifetime is dominated by long lifetime components. So it will be overwhelmed by lens fluorescence. Don't use TI for FLEO. I just showed it here. Look at this. This is it's the same data set. The M is around 500 picoseconds. The M12 is 350 picoseconds. And this is almost 1.5 nanoseconds. The reason is that the lens fluorescence shows up massively in this TI. Don't use it for fear. So good. So the component lifetimes and amplitudes. This is interesting is not only TM or TM12, it could be interesting to look at the individual amplitudes, A1, T1 lifetimes, amplitudes, lifetimes of the components. This is fast component, the second fastest component, and this is the third component, which I, in contradiction to Martin, I call it the lens fluorescence. And what you see here is that actually, the T, the amplitude both the, the amplitudes of the of these of T3 are very evenly distributed only in the optical disc. Discs are different. So this is an indication some contribution comes from the optical disc, but no com com contribution from the fundus. If there would be something from the fundus, okay, 
then it should be just homogeneous distributed over the fullness. But again, no, no further, dis I would say we, we shouldn't do any further discussion about this problem. We have to get more data. So what you should know is you can select these amplitudes, just select the, the, the right lifetime, T1, T2, T3, or select A1, A2, A3 as an imaging parameter. So an important thing is the lifetime histogram or the parameter histogram. It shows you how frequently a given parameter appears in the image. So I, we have used, or I have used here these, these distributions umpteen times, but it's, it's of course, it's an interesting thing to look at. It shows you, first it shows you how accurate the whole thing is and how homogeneous this is. This is tau M12 and you see, well, it, it's very evenly distributed. By the way, this here, this is the optical disc, also gives a contribution, but I, it's outside the displayed range. That means in, in, in reality here around 1.5 nanoseconds, there's another bump it comes from the, from the optical disc. So the width of the histogram is of course in part controlled by noise from the photon disk statistic. That means it should decrease with increasing photon number. And I've done this here. This is for 6,000 photons, 17,000 photons, and 56,000 photons per binning area. So you see it becomes narrower with more photons as expected. This is for free shift. This is for the fixed shift. And we see it doesn't become narrower. The edges become steeper, but it doesn't become narrower. That means there is real heterogeneity in the, in the image because the width is, width is mainly constant, constant for different numbers of photons. And it means there is a real change in the image. In this case, it's the time invariation coming from the scanner. So what we should take home is the width of the histograms and the shape of the histogram is always a quality indicator. So another question which we didn't discuss here, but it's it's very often it's tried. Can we analyze decay curves with fixed component lifetimes? Okay, the argument is okay if we just have a few fluorophores with different lifetimes and all the changes we are seeing here are just coming from different concentrations of these fluorophores. Or if we have different forms of fluorophores, different binding states, and the, the amount of these states is changing, okay, then the component lifetimes, T1, T2, T3, should remain constant, and only the amplitudes should change. So this is an image calculated with three component lifetimes. If I fix the component lifetimes, to the lifetimes I find, it find in this pixel or around this pixel, I get this. Okay, it's the same. And if you compare the distribution, this distribution is of course narrow, much narrower. The reason is we, of course, we have a more rigid model and it gives us less noise. So, but what happens if I take my component lifetimes, not from this position, but from the center of the fovea here, yeah. then I get a different image. The lifetime in the rest of the image has changed. So the conclusion is, if you do something like fi fixing lifetimes, then the results are only correct for the closer area around the position from where you have taken the component lifetimes. Obviously, the component lifetimes here and here are not the same. And if you fit the image with wrong component lifetimes, of course, the result is plainly wrong. It doesn't represent the true parameters of the, of the fluorescence decay. So if you have to do this, for instance, to, to 
to reject noise because you want to to figure out a little detail or maybe one of these amplitudes extremely ac accurately, then you can do this, but be careful. It works only around the location from where you have taken the lifetimes. So, display of images. Eco asked me about that. Uh, that uh, that's the reason that I put it in here. So the, of course, an important question is the parameter range, which parameter range to select. Of course, you should select one which somehow displays the image reasonably. Your, the parameter distribution should be somehow reasonably inside the parameter histogram and inside the color range, that's all. And you can change the, the parameter range by typing in these values, range, minimum, and maximum, or you can grab cursors here at the, at the edge of the distribution and, for instance, pull it in, then this, this, the, the lifetime range changes. You see the colors have changed and this has changed as well. So you can change it both from here or from here. You don't have to calculate once more. It's just a different display of your data, different representation. So, direction of the lifetime scale. This is from blue to red. This is from red to blue. This is your personal, personal reference, how you do this. I don't know whether there is a, a convention, whether your images should be displayed this, in this direction or this direction. If you publish something, you just should make clear which color direction you used. <coughs> Brightness and contrast, this is maybe a bit controversial. What I prefer is brightness and contrast of the image somewhere here in the middle. And we get an image which both shows the lifetimes and it also shows the anatomic structures. The FLEO style, which I haven't seen very often, is this. The FLEO people tend to pull up the brightness to 100% and the the contrast to almost 100%. And the result is you see only the color of the image. The color, of course, still represents the lifetime of the, of the pixels involved, but the anatomic structures are totally hidden. So this is obscuring the anatomic structures. I don't know whether this is, is intended and whether it's desirable. Of course, of course, it's your decision. I must say, I don't like it because here, you see here, that's a good example. Here you see these slight lifetime changes along the blood vessels. They're also here, they're visible here, but you can't see anymore that this is associated with blood vessels. So I don't like this. This, this representation very much. If you like it, you can use it and you know how to use it, but just be aware that you obscure the anatomical structures. Here's another thing. Gated intensity. This is actually the opposite of this. If you have a patient or a lifetime image, which has a lot of lens fluorescence, then the image looks foggy because they also in the, in, in the intensity data, you see the, the photons from the, from the lens of the eye. So this is foggy. You can use gated intensity to improve this. Gated intensity means I take the intensity of this image, not from the whole decay curve, but only from a part of it. And I can select the cursors in a way that I select a time range where the fluorescence of the fundus is strongest. Then I get this image. And you see this image has a noticeably, noticeably better contrast than this one. The rest is the same. But it's, it's just done by time gating and the, ray, the contrast ratio between fundus fluorescence and lens fluorescence is improved. The rest is not changed. You see, the lifetime distribution is the same. The decay curve is the same. It's only a different way to, to display the intensity of the fluorescence image. So questions to this part? Here is something 
which which I I must say I, I've never seen very much about that in in fluo publications. Maybe I didn't see didn't find these publications or I didn't read them carefully enough. So and this is ratios of parameters. SPC image lets you do this very easily. Here I have created a ratio of T1 divided by T, uh, T2 divided by T1. And you get a different image. Whether it tells you something is a good question. I don't know. So at least it tells you whether T1 goes in the same direction as T2. And here, for instance, I have calculated this here. This is under coding off, you can define a something like, like this equation or definition, T1. It says T1 divided by, T2 divided by T1 of channel one. So of course it's channel one. And what we actually see here is that the, the change of the fovea is mainly in T1 because this, they don't go, they, they, uh, they don't go in, in step, if T1 and T2 would go in step, we wouldn't see a blue spot here. So you can do such things. And I suggest, that especially if you have some, some early stages of eye diseases, I suggest that you try some of these things. Maybe, or maybe not, we can squeeze out a little bit more information about that. This is a ratio A1 divided by A2. It doesn't show very much here, but the A1, A2 ratio in, 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 in other experiments is very important. You could uh, talked about uh, about the FAD, so it's worth to look at this. I have only mostly only healthy patients, so I can't tell you whether a, ratio A1 A2 tells us something. And here is something which is new, which you probably haven't seen yet. And this is the dual channel configuration of SPC image. So the FLIR instrument has two channels, and you can display them both. Simply click into options, channels, and turn this, this, this is a little bit strange here. You click on on and you have the second channel is turned on. You have two images. This is from the short wavelength channel. This is now from the long wavelength channel. You can define different, different time scales for them. You can display different parameters. And the most interesting thing is you can also calculate ratios of parameters from different channels. So what I have done here, this is the left image shows TM12 of channel one divided by TM12 of channel two. And we see they are not identical and they don't go in step, which means this is one of the questions which was asked in the discussion before. It shows that the two wavelength images really show different things. This is the T1, TM12 image of channel two. We can, could also define something else here. So I just recommend take a few typical diseases and check whether we can squeeze out something by doing, by, by calculating ratios of parameters from the two different channels, whether these are the TM12 or, or just T1, T2 or T, Tau M, you can also use amplitudes. Just, just check whether something shows up and something is, is just displayed more clearly than with the, with the previous options. So if we, I, I showed you a lot of things here, individual parameters, for instance, A1 divided by A2. If we do such things, we need a very good signal to noise ratio. And that means it's again, the struggle for high photon numbers. Again, this is this big equation. The best lifetime accuracy you can get is square root of n. That means we need more, more photons. What can we do? We want lifetimes of amplitudes and decay components. We want to calculate ratios. We want to do so with low noise and high accuracy. So we need more photons. And how can we get them without exceedingly long acquisition time? And the way to do this is, of course, pixel binning. 
And if I talk about pixel binning, I normally cause an uproar, especially in microscopy. If, if they hear the, the, hear the word binning, they get crazy on me. So why does it make sense to spatially bin pixels? So we always have to do with the point spread function. In microscopy, it's just caused, caused by this diffraction. In, in ophthalmoscopy, it, this point rest function is maybe also be determined by, by the quality of the, of the lens of the eye. So anyway, the image is not totally strong. And if this is my point, the central part of my point spread function, there is actually no need to analyze this pixel by pixel by pixel by pixel. I combine, I can combine an area which is approximately the size of the, of the point spread function, and I don't lose much spatial, spatial resolution by that. But on the other hand, I get much more photons inside this area, and I get a higher lifetime accuracy. There are probably you do this anyway. And the, the trick which, which we're using here, actually, we're using overlapping binning. So for this pixel of the result, we use this binning area. For this one, we use this binning area. So the binning areas are overlapping. So the result is we get a better lifetime accuracy. The, the lifetime information is a little bit smeared out, but not very much. But the intensity data have the original, original resolution. So here's an, again an example from microscopy. No binning. Image looks a bit noisy. Binning factor two means five by five pixels are binned. Very good lifetime accuracy, no noise in the lifetime, but still a good spatial resolution of the lifetime. Here, look at these little items here, this, this, this feature which looks like a stalk. Here, this little blob is still shown in yellow color. And, but only if we go to binning nine by nine, we see, we see changes in tiny little details, but only in tiny little details. So we can got, get a lot of improvement in lifetime by the binning. Here's an example for FLIO. This is no binning. Our lifetime distribution is terribly broad. Again, my love TM12. Terribly broad. The image doesn't tell us very much. Very low photo numbers in one pixel. So this is Pinning factor two, which means five by five image is reasonable. Lifetime distribution is reasonably, has a reasonably reasonable width. We can go farther, five by five pixels. Lifetime distribution becomes better. Noise becomes, becomes lower. And if I go higher, I get less noise, but it's not clear whether I'm really allowed to do this because we can potentially hide or just blur out tiny little details in the lifetime. So the question is, which binning should we use? And my experience from analyzing FLIO images is that a good binning factor to start with is bin, bin equal to, which means binning five by five pixels. So this gives reasonable results. So the question is, we can, of course, I said, we can go higher, but how far can we go? And this, of course, it depends on, on what we want to see. It, this, this, is, this is from Lydia Sauer again. These are FLIO images from different diseases. So if we, this is healthy, okay, we can certainly bin this by, with five by five pixels. This is MACTO, okay. Not the structures are relatively large. Here, the structure is extremely large, except for the phonia. Again, macular macula hole is small, but this atrophic AMD albinism, retina pigmentosa uveitis, we can use relatively large binning here. The only thing where we can't use it is stark up disease because this is, these are small features. So once we have an idea of what we are looking for, we can apply a different binning to the data. So this is just my rep recommendation. Try with different binning, and with higher binning, you may get an, an extremely efficient increase in the lifetime accuracy. So here's another question. What would happen 
if we record the data. I say conjunctive. What would record? Because I don't want to 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 hear an echo crying. He can't make a change in the instrument. So higher number of pixel in the recording. If we record with higher numbers of pixels, of course, we have less photons per pixel, but we can compensate it, this by binning an SPC image. So what can, ha can happen? What would happen? Here's an example from microscopy. This is a 128 by 128 pixel image. No binning. OK? We see reasonable lifetimes, reasonable decay curves, but the image is, of course, blurry because of the low pixel number. This is a recording with 512 by 512 pixels. Same acquisition time, same laser intensity, same number of total photons in the image. So, and the loss in photon number in the individual pixels is, has been compensated by binning. So we, binning is, sorry. Five binning. I think that binning is four by uh, five by five here. Yeah, I forgot to mention this. So again, number of photons is approximately the same, but this image has a much better spatial resolution than this. It looks much better. So it, I leave it to you to decide whether you want to see this image or this image. I, if I if I look at this, I always think I have the wrong glasses on. Whereas this, this is a good image. So here it's a bit bigger. This is a huge image. And at the moment, the FLIO is, as far as I saw this from the data, is recording the FLIM images with 256 by 256 pixels. What if we would go up to 512 pixels and increase the binning? We would certainly get a sharper image. So I would, it would be, happy if I could try this, and this is just a question to the Heidelberg engineering people. Can you change a para just the, the, the number of pixel parameter in the acquisition software and just record one good data set with 512 by 512 pixels, send it to me and I can check whether we get a, a better image from this. I understand that we can't implement this in, uh, right now in a medical instrument, but at least we should, if we are really able to get higher resolution data, we should at least record them and keep, keep them available for us. So if it's necessary to show someone that we have also have higher resolution, we can put it out of the drawer. So this is something I would like to try. So again, the struggle for more photons. Can we get even more photons than by binning? And this is something I said at the beginning, the new SPC image software is a combination with the phaser plot. Can we somehow use the phaser plot? What is the phaser plot? To make it short, it's not necessary that you know all these details. The phaser plot, is a representation of our data after transformation from the time domain into the frequency domain. And actually, in fact, what happens is that the shape of a decay curve, only the shape, is represented by a magnitude in the phase. This is just a, two numbers. So we have a fast decay. We put, make this, this transformation. And from this decay, we get a, a magnitude, which is the length of this pointer. And we get a phase, which is the angle of this pointer. This point is called the phaser. It's just the end point of this vector. Fast decay is here, a slow decay is here. A mixture of a fast and a slow decay is somewhere on the connection line between these, these both. So, what happens, this is just for a single decay curve. A single decay curve gives a single point in the phaser space. If we have a whole image and do this transformation for all pixels, we get a whole cloud of phasers. It is here. That means every pixel here forms one dot in this phaser plot. And the location of this, of this dot in the phaser plot depends on the shape of the decay function in this pixel. 
So if the decay time is short, it's here. If it's long, it's here. If it's a combination of two, it's somewhere on this line. And you see what we get here. And the interesting thing is now, can we use possibly, the first question is, can we possibly use this phaser plot to turn up some, some indications or so some signatures of diseases? Here's something interesting. You see, the phaser, we give the phaser plot the same color as, the, as, as we have in the, in, the, in the time domain plot, in the lifetime image. And you see here, this is blue. The fovea, or the, the macula, whatever this is, is a combination of both, is here. In this patient, in this image, it's here. Take another, this is again this image. Take a, this is a patient, six, in the moment of the measurement, he was uh, 62 years old. This is a young patient. The fovea points in this direction. Does it mean something? I don't know. If it does, it would be interesting. So I just recommend that you put a few lifetime images of diseases or early stages of diseases or patients of different age and so on and so on in the phaser plot and see whether you see characteristic differences. This is the first thing. Yes, by the way, this is, this is again the 64 years patient. Fovia is here. And this is the AMT patient. And interestingly, the fovea of the AMT patient, I don't, don't show the lifetime image here, it's also here. It doesn't go down here as in the young patient, it's here. It's probably the, this, this pattern of the fovea of this patient, is it an indication that this, this patient may later develop AMD? We don't know, but it's something to follow up. Could be interesting. So. The last point before we have dinner, image segmentation by phaser plot. We have this phaser plot and we can select a cluster in this phaser plot. I select this cluster as a selection tool and it's back annotated in the lifetime image. I see this is the optical disk. And what I then I can do an interesting thing, I see, say, sum up decay curve, this is here. And I get a decay curve of the combined pixel in the, in the whole phaser cluster, which I selected, or in, in this structure of the image back annotated. So in other words, I can select features in the image which have a similar decay signature, similar phases, and get very, accurate decay data from these pixels. We have the decay results here. Here's another, another example here. I selected the fovea, combine the fovea, get very good data for the fovea, can, and I can analyze it with high accuracy. These are these, this patient that I included before has this strange, uh, uh, probably deposits along the, the blood vessels. I can select them in the, find them in the phaser plot, select them, combine decay curve again, very accurate decay analysis. Oh, here, this is the area around the optical disc and some of the vessels. Interestingly, it's not the same phaser location. The, if you look here, the color in the, in the image is almost the same as here, but it's a different place in the phaser plot. Also here, we can look at the decay parameter and compare them exactly. So this is a few new things which we can do with new SPC image. I would love to, to try it on, on other data, but I don't have more data. And if you know, I really would be happy if you could send me something. Okay, as a conclusion of the whole thing, what should we do? What should be the plan for FLIO for the next future, from my point of view? The first thing is use the new data analysis pro principles and profit from the better reproducibility. Whether you use the TM12 or the TM is, is not essential, but 
I'm sure everything becomes better reproducible. Next thing is re-evaluate existing data with the new models, with the new tools, squeeze out more information for them, from them. And look at component data. I haven't seen many, many data where information was extracted from, from component data. And the other thing, which would be a wish from me, get data for early stages of of diseases, not final diseases. If we have developed diseases, okay, we can see them also in normal intensive image. Early stages are the uh, are, are really the the point. Try the new approaches on the early stages, and find out which approach shows the signs of a particular disease best. Whether you use a special binning, whether you lose the the phase of plot, ratios of components doesn't matter, just find it out whether there's still some, some improvement possible. No, I think it is. Get a CPU, especially for such uh, trials, you can't, you can't uh, run, uh, you can't spend 20 minutes for every calculation. With the GPU, you get it within seconds. So, and please keep us in the line. If I say us, then I mean Becker Nickel and Nigel Beck Engineering. Keep us in the line when new, new results, new data, manuscripts for papers are available. We will really read it. I have my private secretary, he helps me a lot. And this helps us to refine the new data analysis procedures and maybe develop new ideas. And to do this, this is, this is it's really a practical problem. We need a fast and easy way to exchange data. I know this is a problem because uh, it's just, a, a matter of, of page, patient secrecy and, and uh, if the clinical people are not allowed to, to exchange patient data, but we must find a way. And if we found an, uh, in the worst case, maybe we have to find an organization which contains all the FLEO groups and give it a name and the patients maybe have to sign up that the data can be exchanged within this organization. And we put a border around this organization that nothing goes out. So this is what I have to say at the end. And actually, I'm at the end of this presentation. And 